So, um, we're, this is the class on Tatoja City Soul. Um, this is safer. We're actually on page 49, section 2 of the Mimer. This is class 10. And just just to review, it's a, a collection of talks and Hasidic discourses that the previous Rebbe said when he was in Chicago to a group of people who came to listen to him. And I think that um, this mimer, as we mentioned last week, was the first mimer that he said when he arrived in Chicago, the evening that he arrived on the 7th of Shvat, um, 1942. And we went through the first section of the Mimer last week. So just to review for a moment the main ideas of that of that first section is as for, for my Mimer in general, Hasidic discourses in general, we have a quote from a pasuk or a quote from Gemara, a quote from some part in Torah that is then re-explained, re-examined, re re um, it defined on a deeper level and and then some deeper message is brought out from it. So the Pasuk that is being used here is from Tehillim, which is um, in English, trust in Hashem and do good while in the lands and be nourished by your faith. And what the previous Rebbe talked about um, last in the last section was these four stages of trusting in Hashem, doing good, tranquil life, and being nourished by faith are actually two instructions and two um, assurances, right? That trusting God and doing good um, are, and it's, are uh, that, that these two things, uh, trusting God and doing good are um, sort of instructions and resting in the land, tranquil life, living in the land, he's using that interchangeably in the, um, and being nourished by faith are the two um, sort of results. And what we're talking about in general is like, what's the difference between, or what's the idea of being nourished by faith? And then then he explains the puzzle on a deeper level that dwelling in the land and being nourished by our faith are the idea of a moon of faith, but trusting in God and doing good are now being explained as the idea of bitachon, not, not a moon, but bitachon. And then the verse is described as um, the first two talking about bitachon and the second two talking about emuna. And the reason why the first two which talk about bitachon are the sort of the, the commands and sort of the caution is because bitachon is harder than emuna that we have to um, we have to really like this was cautioning us about our bitachon, about our trust more than amuna, um, that it's harder to generate. And then he goes, um, the mimer continues into this idea that every Jew has amuna, every Jew has faith. It could be concealed and it needs to be aroused, but every Jew has faith. Um, and a person has to really labor very hard to get his bitachon to show. So then it goes into the idea of what does it mean to uncover and be nourished by our faith, that which is what the Pasuk is talking about. That means that we have to really um, actualize the faith. And the way that we have to actualize the faith, it goes into discussing how we want faith to be revealed in our body and our soul powers in our body it goes into a parable here about eating and drinking about how eating and drinking physically um, enables like the life force of the body the, the soul and the physical body to stay together and even for the soul powers to be brought out by you know physically eating and that even the type of diet that a person eats if it's a healthier diet then the soul strong the soul powers are stronger stronger or felt strong more strongly in the body and the fusion between body and soul is stronger um, and even the 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 very delicate powers of like the mind and the heart not just like the feet and the hands but the minds and the heart are also affected by the eating and drinking and so um, we see that the physical 
nourishment affects the body and soul's connection and the ability for the soul to reveal itself. And so too, he says, is the case with serving Hashem and, and nurturing our amuna that we have to nurture and sustain our amuna, which means that we want it to, we want the amuna to be felt everywhere in our minds and our hearts, ultimately in our action. And the way that we do that is by doing Tara and Mitzvahs with spiritual and physical exertion. So define spiritual exertion by working hard to reveal our soul powers, physical exertion by sort of weakening the hold that the body has over us, and that we really spend time trying to think of Hashem and understand Hashem. And when we do that, and we like push ourselves to, to, to work ourselves to understand, then our mitzvahs are done in a completely different manner than we have sort of incorporated more life into our into our mitzvahs. And so this idea that it's parallel to the physical life of the body, that eating and drinking affects physical and spiritual faculties. And so too, exerting body and soul affects our spiritual faculties. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to really exert ourselves to understand godly concepts and that by itself that will help us to have our faith, our natural faith permeate us and into our minds, into our heart, into our deeds. That that's a like a sort of a general overview review of the first section of the mimer. Um, and now Mr. will start the second section. I don't know if anybody wants to say anything or ask any questions before we go into the second section. Again, the second section begins on page 49. If you want to open up to page 49. Any questions or comments before we start that? Okay, so then let's so let's start on page 49 and um, the second section of the mimer. So the explanation of the above concepts is based on the concept that Maish Rabbeinu is called a Raya Mehemna, meaning both a faithful shepherd and a shepherd of faith. Um, that's the translation. Raya is a shepherd, Mehemna, faith. So we can translate it both as the faithful shepherd, that he's faithful to his flock, and that he shepherds the faith of the Jewish people, that he helps us to actualize our faith. Um, people will recognize this as the pivotal idea in the Maimar Atzatetzava from the Rebbe. But here, this is from the previous Rebbe, he's bringing this idea. So why is he called the Raya Mehemna? Because he nourishes and sustains the souls of the Jewish people with faith, so that their faith will be increased, expanded, and greatly strengthened. Um, that means that they take their faith, and it's going to be ribwe in the Hebrew, his pastors, it's going to really be expanded, it's going to be increased, and it's going to be strengthened. And that's something that we want to have, right? The faith is there latent, but we want it to be actualized. And Meshavenu helps that to happen. Meshavenu was called this faithful shepherd. Um, when Hashem calls out to Moshe for the burning from the burning bush, the Pasuk states, Moshe, Moshe, says his name twice. The Idra Rabbah, on page 138a, notes that there's no cantillation mark indicating a pause between the first and second time his name is called. In other words, it's not Moshe, comma, Moshe. It's just Moshe, Moshe without a pause. However, in the phrases Avraham, Avraham, Yaakov, Yaakov, Shmuel, Shmuel, which are also people in the Torah that Hashem has called twice, there is a cancellation mark indicating a pause between their names. So it's like Avram, Avram, Yaakov, Yaakov, Shmuel, Shmuel, whereas it's just Maisha, Maisha. And the way that the, when we lay in the Torah, the way that it's read indicates according to the punctuation, there's no comma between the names. So this is going to be very you know, even a small comma, or yes, there's a comma, or no, there's a comma, is a huge indicator of some very deep spiritual truth, which, which is, which is going to explain. So Hasidic texts explain that when God calls a person's name twice, this indicates that he is addressing the soul as it exists in its spiritual source, as well as the soul as it is manifested in a lower spiritual world. 
I should maybe digress for a minute and say when in the in the in the revealed aspects of Torah, it says when Hashem calls a person's name twice, it's it's a show of love, like He's reaching out with love. The mystical explanation of the two times it's calling out the name is that it's calling to the the soul as it's sourced in the heavens, at a, in its spiritual source, and the soul as it is manifested in the lower spiritual world, the high, the source in the spiritual world and the lower spiritual world. So it's actually a, it's actually a, a, like a deep message. Regarding Avraham, Yaakov, and Shmuel, there was a difference between the radiance of the soul on the lower level compared with the soul as it exists in its spiritual source. With Maisha, this was not the case, as explained below. In other words, Maisha did not have any dichotomy between the spiritual source and how he uh, the, the lower realms, whereas the other tzaddikim who Hashem called twice did have there was a dichotomy. The Zohar explains from the moment Moshe was born, he was perfect, complete is really the word. His soul in its source above and his soul invested in his body were in perfect continuity without a break between them. That's very unusual. In fact, this is this it says about Maisha doesn't even say it about Avraham or Yaakov or Shmuel Hanavi. As the verse states, how, how do we see this? How do we see that he had such a high level of completion, even from the moment that he was born? As the verse states, when Yocheved looked at her son Maisha, and the Pasuk said, states, she saw he was good. She saw that he was good. And the Torah said, Kitaif. Our sages interpret this to mean that the house became filled with light when Moshe was born. There's a, there's a lot of um, discussion about what does it mean when Yochavit said that she saw that, that he was good. Um, it can't mean regular goodness of any child because it doesn't say that every time every child is born. I mean, every mother thinks the baby is good. Um, but it doesn't say in the Torah that they saw that their baby was good, right? This is the only time it says it. So the commentators have a very huge discussion about what was this goodness in Maisha. There's many, many explanations about what was this goodness. Rashi picks um, the one of that she saw he was good meant that the house became filled with light, which is based on the Medrash or on the Gemara. Um, and that's like the main opinion. There's many other opinions as well. And they're all true, but this one becomes the main opinion. And it's actually interesting because um, it seemed to be representative of his bringing light into the world. In other words, he was born and he brought light into the world, literally, because in his lifetime, he was gonna bring the light of Torah into the world, that he was gonna be a leader of the Jewish people that shed light for the Jewish nation. You know, people need light to see where they're going and to, and to walk forward and to get things accomplished. And he represented this idea of being that leader and bringing that knowledge and understanding to the Jewish people. And therefore, literally, physically, when he was born, he was, he filled the house with light. That's one of the ways that they saw that he was a special baby and they and they tried to save his life um, when around them, babies were being put to death. Uh, why did they think he had a chance? I mean, all these babies were being put to death by the Egyptians. Why did they think he had a chance? It was because of the special qualities that they saw in him. And the main one, like I said, was that the house became filled with light. The uniqueness of Moshe's spiritual potential can be understood by the following preface. Um, there are those who serve God with their souls, and there are those and those who serve God with their bodies. It's like an interesting way of putting it. An interesting wording. There are those who serve God with their souls, and those those who serve God with their bodies. What is the difference between them? What does that mean? The difference between them is that those who serve God with their bodies have to purify and refine their bodies and their emotional attributes, their midas. Um, they have to like make their bodies more transparent to godliness. However, those who serve God with their souls are unique individuals whose bodies and emotional attributes are perfected and don't require any labor of refinement. For the latter type of people, who are obviously much fewer than the former type of people, the entire reason for their dis the descent of their soul is for the sake of others rather than to rectify themselves. Meaning most of us 
we're born and part of our job is to purify our ourselves you know to make ourselves more um refined in our in and able to serve hashem that's part of our mission right another part of our mission is to refine the world and make the world more of a of a vehicle and a vessel to re to receive hashem's light so we're doing it on a macrocosm level that we're trying to purify the world and we're doing it on a microcosm level that we're trying to refine ourselves and sort of like that job right we're trying to show how the physical how physicality actually is part of you know the creation and its inner life force is hashem and everything that there would be no world if there wasn't hashem and you know all the things that we talk about you know the world is nothing it's just bringing into being and so on and so forth but when we look at the world like we talked about in a different time we did earlier in the year we look at the world right and in, in, in Basilagani, but there's a sheker in the world there's a lie in the world that makes it seem that there's no godliness and it's covering over godliness and it looks like it has an independent existence and we have to make that sheker that lie into a keresh into a beam for the mishkan that houses hashem's presence and then into a kesher into a connection between hashem and the world right that's what our job is to do um but that's also our job to do for ourselves because we're supposed to make ourselves into that mishkan too we're supposed to refine ourselves and 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 show that we are part of hashem and you know become more transparent to hashem so we're trying to make a dwelling for hashem in this lower realm in the physical world and in ourselves but here what the free is saying is that that's only most people <laughs> Most people have that job, both of those halves. Some people just have the half of refining the world. They don't have any self-refinement that they have to do. The reason why they're here is to be leaders and teachers and inspiration to other people to do that for themselves. In other words, that and that was the that was Maisha's job. Maisha's job was to, this is what the Zahar means when it states that Maisha was perfect, meaning he didn't have to do um, refinement of his character. Um, he he was here. He had a, a certain type of a soul, right? The soul that that had, doesn't when it's described how it's coming into the physical world. There's no comma. So his Manisha Moshe is no comma. His soul had like a direct uh, no processing along the way coming from the heaven from the source of souls into his, into this world. It didn't have. It's not. It was raw. It wasn't processed didn't have any need to for self-rectification it was here to bring light which is why when he was born the house filled with light because that was what his job was going to be and that's sort of reflected in the Torah by the fact that it says Maisha Maisha without a comma now really this part of the mimer is going to talk about the other you know why there is a comma and then the next section is is going to mention again this idea but Maisha didn't have a comma um, and then talk about two different kinds of souls but um, that's sort of that's where we're going with this are we okay so far the, this seems to suggest that there there are others like this others like although Maisha? I thought that Maisha was unique in this way you're saying other people that yeah right there are great sadi right there are there are leaders in every generation the the level of prophecy that Maisha had it says no other navi had but the level of leadership um there's there are there are there's a leader in every generation um so it does right it does it does seem to say there are those who it's not one but um, Maisha was was the greatest prophet who ever lived. Chaya, did you say that Moshe didn't have a soul? No. M Moshe's soul was so high that he oh. he was able to serve Hashem with a soul. With his soul, his soul came from such a high realm and came into the physical world without any like processing. Meaning, it didn't have any didn't pick up any dirt along the way in its travel to the world. So it had no rectification that it needed to do for his body. His body, his soul and his body, he, his whole purpose in coming into the world 
was united, his soul and his body was united to such a degree that his physical body emitted light when he was born into the room, showing that he was he had a completion of body and soul. And one of the other, one of, I mean, just I'll add this here, it's not part of the mimer, but one of the other opinions, the other sort of main opinion of what the what the good was that he that he's that he that she saw in him was that he was born with a bris, that he was born with a circumcision, um, which also is rare, but it's, he wasn't the only person who was born with a bris. There's people even in this generation who are born with a bris, and that and that is seen to be indicative of a spiritual refinement that the person already has, um, because the bris itself is about refining the body. So if they're born with a bris already, then they are seen to represent a, a more of a purified body, basically. So the, uh, that's the other. And then the Rebbe explains how these two main ideas of the light and the bris reflect his completion and his perfection as an individual person, which is reflected in the bris, and his completion um, and perfection as a leader, which is, which is represented in the light that's shown in the house. Really, in this mind, the Rebbe is just bringing, the Friedrich Rebbe is just bringing the idea of the light to show that um, he represents this kind of person that their body, their bodies didn't need perfection um, and refinement. The entire reason for the descent of their souls is for the sake of others rather than to rectify themselves. You know, they don't have a previous lifetime that they're here rectifying or something like that. They're just here to do a service in the world. We, ha we have a tradition that, you know, the Baal Shem Tov said that the Alter Rebbe's soul was a new soul that had never been in the world before also. Uh, he also didn't have a rectification of a previous lifetime to do. He had a new path in the service of Hashem that he was here to, to write the Tanya, basically, and to teach everybody Hasidah so that this new study of Torah, this deeper level of Torah, could be given to, to the world. Okay, ready to go on? Thank you. Sure. Okay, so the entire purpose of the descent, so on the bottom of page 50, the entire purpose of the descent of Moshe's soul was in order to receive the Torah and teach it to the Jewish people. Like that's, that's what his job was. That's what he needed to do. That's what he did. Um, this is the different, this is also the difference between Avraham and Moshe. Where it says Avraham, comma, Avraham. Avraham, Avraham is read with a pause in the cancellation, whereas Maisha, Maisha is read without a pause in the cancellation. Why? What does this teach us? You know, it says that you couldn't, um, Rabbi Akiva could explain even the, the crowns on top of the letters of the Torah. There are certain letters in which written in what's called Ksav Ashuris, the, the, the type of writing that's written in the, in the Torah scroll, the, the print, the font, I guess you would say in today's language, um, has little crowns on top of the letters and he could explain each crown and the meaning of it in 70 different ways, all the different way, meanings of the crowns, just the crowns of letters, throughout the letters themselves or the words or the psukim. Here we're explaining a comma. It's not even part of the letter, it's part of the punctuation and we're learning this very profound lesson. So why is it, why is it that there's a pause between Avraham and no pause between Maisha? This is because the manner in which Avraham's soul existed in the world of Bria and the manner in which Avraham's soul existed in the world of Atilas are not the same nature as if we could possibly understand that. But what it's saying basically is that right, we have four worlds in the order of creation. There's four spiritual worlds and then we get to this fifth level of, of our world, the physical world that the souls sort of, they, they, come, they come down into the physical world. They go through like this process of coming down. And the way that Avram's soul shined in the world of Atsilas, which is the highest world, is not the same manifestation of Avram's soul in the next world down, Bria. This is still spiritual worlds. We didn't even get to getting into the body yet. But even that step from that world to the next world in the spiritual world, it's not the same. It, as our Rebbe of blessed memory, the Alter Rebbe writes in Egeris HaKadosh, that's the part of Tanya, the last part of Tanya, letter 15, citing the teaching that he heard from his master, the Magad of Mizrich, on the verse line, dust and ashes. So, Anachi 
Anaychi Afer Ve'efer, Avraham says, I'm dust and ashes. So our forefather Avraham made this statement about the radiance of his soul, which shined in his body from the light of supernal chesed. So what are we saying? We're saying that Avraham described himself as dust and ashes. That's what he described himself. But the Pasuk says it. We don't have to say it. He says it right there in the Torah. This is a direct quote. And, you know, quote, Avram said, I am dust and ashes. What did he mean by that? So on a deeper level, he meant that this, his, the, the um, way that his soul came into the world from the highest realms into the lower realms is like dust and ashes. The, 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 the Rebbe is going to explain now what dust and ashes represent you know, how that, like, how that's a parable for this idea. Um, but it's going to talk about the source of Avraham's soul and then how it came down into different spiritual realms and how the lower spiritual realms of Avraham's soul are like dust and ashes compared to the source of Avraham's soul. How, how his soul was in its source, I should say, right? It's like, it's as if dust and ashes and dust and ashes, which are created from wood, and basically what we're going to go on to say is that dust and ashes of the wood, which, you know, the dust and ashes come from the wood, but it's nothing like wood. It would is the same idea of the sort of the level of the source of the soul versus how the soul came into lower realms, that it's it's made from the same stuff, but it's not the same. It's not the same thing. The way the dust and ashes are not the same thing as the wood that the dust and ashes come from. Basically, that's it's like a, it's going to be it's going to be explained as a parable. I remember, using it as a parable to explain his neshama, okay? And we're going to go on a little bit of a Kabbalistic ride before we get there. Before we get to that idea, we have to define all these places that the soul came from and how Abraham was like and everything else. So it's going to be a little Kabbalistic for a few minutes before we get to that point of wood, dust and ashes, Abraham's soul, Abraham's soul. You had a question? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you talk about souls and the worlds, does do all souls go through all the worlds to come into this world, or or do our souls have different sources that they come from directly from worlds that they come from? Well, sort of both, the, and, the, and the and the level of the soul and its mission and everything is determined and where it sort of exits. That's what we're saying, that Moshe's soul was a soul of Atzilus. It's called a soul of Atzilus. You know, it came from the highest realms and sort of came directly into this world from the highest realms with no no comma in between. Oh, because um, I thought you were saying, I thought you were saying that um, Abraham's soul was the same, or sorry, was not the same in the higher world and then the next lower world. Does that right. mean Adam's that his soul, went soul from descended? Atilis into Bria. His soul is descending from Atilis to the next world, which is Bria, and it wasn't exactly the same in both realms. It, it, the, the radiance of the soul and wasn't that, the same in both realms. The soul is always the same, but the way it's expressing itself is not the same. And then entered this world through Bria or? I, I don't like, know. I, 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 I don't not, know. That. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't say, and I wasn't there. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So we don't have a way of knowing the, the, the path that our souls took to get here. We don't know the path our souls took to get here. But okay. you know, some we can guess, right? When people have a we we don't know. We don't know, but we know that there's different paths and then there's different sources. I mean, ultimately all sorts souls are sourced in Hashem, but there's different sort of levels, I guess, of strength and so on. Thank you. Um, our, okay, so our forefather, Abraham, made this statement about the radiance of his soul, which shined in his body from the light of supernal chesed. So here, here he's saying that Abraham's soul, the source of his soul, and how it shines into his body came from the light of supernal chesed. This is chesed of Atzilos. 
this attribute, the attribute of Ava Rabba, abundant love that derives from the sphere called Chesed of Atzilas, was identified with him. He had such a large amount of high level of Chesed. Uh, Avram epitomized the idea of Chesed, which, which means Chesed of Atzilas, which is Chesed of the highest world. For he loved God with such a great love and, subpl- and sublime that he became a chariot for God. Okay, so he's going to explain what does it mean a chariot for God? That's what the term the Tanya calls it, calls the forefront of the chariot. Abraham's degree of nullification, bitzel to God, was, was like that of a chariot to its driver, having no independent will whatsoever. This is even greater than the subservience of a slave to his master. For the slave nevertheless retains a will of his own, albeit subservient to his master's will. Right? A chariot, a car, or whatever, I mean, in today's parlance, right? It just goes wherever the driver drives it. It doesn't take its own initiative to get someplace. Um, whereas a servant, even if he's subservient to his master's will, but he's still, he's still um, a person who has thoughts of his own. So Abraham is con- compared to a chariot. Um, the forefathers were compared to chariots for Hashem's will. So one might possibly assume that the type of chesed and love that exists above in the supernal spheros is of a similar nature to the attribute of abundant love exemplified by our father Abraham, peace be upon him. Um, in other words, we could think that the type of chesed and love that exists above in the supernal spheres, which is chesed of atzilos, is a similar nature to the attribute of abundant love exemplified by our father, Avraham, peace upon him, in the physical world, like as he so revealed itself in the physical world. It is that it only surpasses it infinitely, meaning that it's just much more abundant because Hashem's midos are, are infinite, whereas the human being's midos are not infinite. For it is known that of the supernal midos that though their mode of emanation is finite, they themselves are infinite and limitless. Hashem's midos are infinite and limitless. The way that they reveal themselves is limited because Hashem chooses to put those lights of his, those, those characteristics of his into vessels that have limitations. But the actual characteristic of Hashem is limitless. Um, because the infinite aims of light actually radiates and, and is vested within them, he and his kalim, the vessels of the spheres, are one. Just as he is infinite, so too are they. So when Hashem has put himself into um, kalim, this, at a very high level, these very high kalim are also considered to be infinite. However, this is not the case regarding the soul of man, which is vested in corp- corporate corporality, I can't, I'm not sure if I pronounce that properly, in man's body, its attributes are finite and limited. Meaning, even Avraham who had what we would call unlimited chesed, from our perspective, is still not the same as Hashem's chesed, because Hashem's chesed is completely limitless. And when a soul is put into a body, into a physicality, um, the body is limited. So therefore, the qualities that are connected to the body are also become limited. So it's not just that um, it's it's not that it's a similar type of love, but the but the Hashem's is infinite and Abraham's is not. It's not, we're not saying that it's just that. Um, because a person's soul and their body is limited and Hashem is not limited. Until now the Aljab has explained that the supernal sphere of chesed is infinitely higher than Avram's attribute of love in this world, meaning Hashem's sphere of love is infinite. It's one with him. It's, it's infinite. He and his vessels are one means he and his midos are one. So Hashem is infinite and his midos of chesed is infinite. Now, in order to negate any comparison whatsoever, he goes on to say that Avraham's attribute of chesed is infinitely lower than the supernal sphere of chesed, meaning now we're going to analyze it from the opposite side. Hashem's chesed is infinitely higher, but Avram's chesed is infinitely lower. It's not the same, even though we, it's both chesed and one comes from the other, but it's not the same. 
So nevertheless, one might have assumed that the Midas of Avraham's soul were of the same quality and type as the supernal Midas. We might have thought that. But he was on such a high level and it's much higher than we are. A chariot to Hashem. So we might have thought that it's the same Mida. But that's why he said, I'm dust and ashes. In other words, Avraham is, is explaining that he views himself as dust and ashes c compared to Hashem's wood, basically, right? His love is like dust and ashes versus, you know, Mahavda, obviously we can't say this about Hashem, but like as, you know, as if Hashem's mida would be wood and his is dust and ashes. It's made from the same stuff, but it's not really the same thing. So this is why he said, I am dust and ashes. For ashes are the essence and substance of the burnt wood, right? It's like, it's what, it's the same thing. You didn't add something else to get the ashes. It's from the wood. For the wood was previously composed of the four basic elements, fire, air, water, and earth, of which all matter is compounded. And that's from, that's from Rambam Valdor, who quotes it in Tanya. And if you look at the footnote, it says, fire, air, water, and earth can perhaps be understood as corresponding to temperature, pressure, viscosity, and matter in a more modern terminology but this is the terminology of Kabbalah, that everything is made up of fire, air, water, and earth. The three elements of fire, water, and air were vaporized and discharged in the smoke that was created by their combination, as is known, meaning when, when something burns up, when it's done burning, there's no more fire, water, or air left in that, in that entity. It, it, that's what sort of escaped or you know, got burned. The fourth element of the wood, namely its component of earth, sinks downwards. That's what's left. Everything else has been sort of separated out by the fire. Fire has no dominion over it because it isn't combustible. But what's left after a fire is the earth element of whatever burned. The other elements, the, the fire, air, and water is what was consumed by the fire. And then the fire dies down and then you have ashes, which is like the earth element of whatever it was that was burned. The whole being of the wood, it's tangible substance, it's matter and it's form in terms of length, width and density, which was visible to the eye before it was burned, derived primarily from the element of earth within it. In other words, the physicality of the wood that we are able to see it, touch it, feel it and so on, was mainly because of the earth element that was in it. We don't see air and, you know, it's like it, it does something, obviously maybe it gives it height or something, but it gives it some kind of, um, you know, broadens the elements of earth, which is very dense. It like, you know, it separates it out. It has water and air in it, but the main part of what it is, uh, is derived primarily from the elements of earth within it. it's a physical thing, which earth is the most physical of the fire air, water, and earth, right? Everything else, it becomes more and more spiritual where you have like fire, you have water, you have, you have I'm sorry, you have um, earth is the physical and then you have water, you have fire, you have air, you know, that, that are less physical, but the physical element was basically from the earth element in it. It's only that the elements of fire, water, and air were also compounded within it. For earth is the most material of all the elements having dimensions of length, width, and density. Unlike fire and air, right? Fire and air don't have length, width, width and density. If you try to contain fire, it goes out. Um, air is much more uh, refined than earth. Even water that is tangible is present in wood only in a small measure, right? When you touch a piece of wood, it doesn't, it doesn't feel wet. So, it's not, it's not, there's not so much water in the wood. So of all the four elements, we've concluded that the main element has to be the earth element. That's what gives it its physicality. That's what gives it its material form. Thus, all the dimensions of wood, of length, width, and density is all, all is of the earth and all returns to the earth. This refers to the ash that remains after the fire, water, and air have been separated from it. So we have a we have a physical thing. 
it's mainly con it's mainly consisting of earth when it's burned the fire water and air aspects of it get consumed and get separated out and it's no longer visible and what's left is the earth now that earth is revealed as ash after the fire right that's what we that's what sort of this ash has no resemblance or comparison to the substance of the large tree with its dimensions of length, width, and density before being burnt, not in quantity or quality, right? If you see like a tree and you see the ash that's after it was burned, the, the, the earth element that's left after it was burned, like it doesn't look like there's anything in common between the two. Like what, what's, what's in common between the two? Nothing, you, you couldn't really even no, unless you did some kind of a chemical study on the on the ash, what it had come from, right? It's not a, it's not visible to the naked eye, what it had come from. So it doesn't bear any resemblance. Even um, even though it the ash is the very substance of the wood from which it came into being. I mean, the ash came from the wood. It didn't come from anywhere else. That's where it came from, but yet you can't tell when you look at the ash, it's not obvious that that's where it came. It's not obvious that that was one time a tree, right? So that becomes now a muscle. What, you know, Avram, again, Avram is describing himself as a nachi of ve'efra. I am like dust and ashes. I'm like dirt and ashes. Why, so we're trying to explain why is he describing himself like that? Why is he describing himself like ash? So we're explaining the physical parable of ash, that ash comes from a substance like a tree, and yet, and it is the substance of the tree, it's the same thing, and yet, it doesn't look that way, act that way, behave that way, seem that way. You can't, you know, it's it's not, it's not the same. And yet it is the same. And yet it's not, and yet it is, right? It comes from, it didn't come from anywhere else. So it has to be the same, but it doesn't look like it's anything else. You know, it's kind of strange. So that becomes a parable. So similarly, metaphorically speaking, our patriarch Avraham spoke of his distinctive attribute, the attribute of kindness and love, which radiated within him and was vested in his body. That's how he, that's how he described his own love compared to the supernal love of Hashem. True, it was the very attribute of love and supernal chesed of Atzilus that radiated in his soul. That's where it came from. And he was a chariot, right? So he didn't interrupt it, which was a chariot, i.e. a channel and medium for the will of Hashem with no sense of self. Like that's how he, nevertheless, as it descended downwards to vest itself in the body by means of the progressive descent of the world from one level to another by way of many contractions, there remains no resemblance or comparison between the nature of the light of the love that radiated within Avraham and the nature of the light of the love and the supernal chasset of Atzilos. That this is like the supernal love of Hashem and this is the love as it came into the world in the soul of Avraham. And Avraham was a chariot, so it was a very high level. And still he calls it, I'm like dust and ashes. The comparison and resemblance between them is merely like that which exists before the substance of the elements of earth, which became ashes. And its substance and quality when it was in the original state as a tree, pleasant to see and good for food, metaphorically speaking. So that substance was in the tree and in the ash, but that's how they're related. It's the same actual substance. So that's how the chesed of Atzilus and the chesed as it manifests itself in Avraham are related. That's not the same thing. The tree went through a process and that chesed went through a process to come into the world. Indeed, the incomparability of Avraham's chesed and the chesed of Atzilus 
actually exceeds the incomparability of the ash and its trees by thousands of degrees of separation, right? Because ultimately, when you're talking about something infinite and something that comes into the physical world, even if it comes in through a soul, it's much larger difference between a tree and its ashes. Nevertheless, the Torah speaks in human phraseology by way of allegory and metaphor. Hence, it uses the analogy of ashes despite its inherent disproportion so that we can understand, right? We, we can understand that the ash is the same as the tree in substance, but it's nothing like the tree really in a certain way either, right? It's both things at the same time. So too, the chassid of Abraham, Abraham describes it as anachi, anachi I'm like ash compared to the tree, so to speak, of Hashem's chassid. Like, yes, it's the same basic thing, but it's just not the same. The above analogy explains the difference between the souls of Avraham and Moshe. The radiance of Avraham's soul below and the root of his soul above are not in the same category. And therefore, Avraham, Avraham is read with a pause in the cancellation. Avraham, comma, Avraham. The soul of Abraham above in Atsilos is not comparable to the soul of Abraham in the lower worlds of Bria, Yetzira, and Asiya as it comes into the world. Now, in, in the next section on the Mimer that I was going to talk about, but what's with Maisha? This is with Abraham, what's with Maisha? What's the difference between them? Um, okay, any, I mean, questions or comments or these are is this is not simple things to talk about we we can't completely understand this but we're doing our best to understand as much as we can and thank god for parables right because this parable is i think very it's a very clear parable i mean for something that's very spiritual it's, a, it's like i said the Torah talks in a way of allegory and metaphors to help us understand well the Torah is helping us understand. Because this is this this parable is something that we can at least relate to. We can understand how the ashes can be part of the tree and not part of the tree at the same time. You know, the same substance of the tree and not the same substance at the same time. Okay, are there what, comments, questions, thoughts? I, yeah. Do you want to say something? I just have a quick question. When you said fire, water, and air, and you get, gave what they are in today's vernacular, could you repeat just repeat those definitions first? Because I never so it's heard in the that book. It's in the, it's in the book. If you, turn, could turn, you can turn back to page 53, and the yeah. footnote at the bottom of the page, it says, oh, I see. fire, Air, water, earth can perhaps be understood as corresponding to temperature, which would be, you know, oh, fire, pressure, viscosity, and matter. Okay. So, like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I don't know who wrote that. I mean, I guess the editor of the Mimer is the one who's suggesting that perhaps these terms, because these terms are, are Kabbalistic terms, right? Uh, they use the words of the, of the, of the creation of the world versus science and things like that. But he's suggesting that maybe that's how, in modern scientific terminology, these four ideas would be considered: um, temperature, the pressure, right, um, atmospheric, or whatever the pressure, mm -hmm. um, viscosity, and matter. Those everything is made up of those, some sort of combination of those four attributes. So the earth is the idea of the matter, and the more physical something is, the more the you know the more matter there is right so mm -hmm. it, I mean even with that like things leave a different amount of ash at the end of a fire um, so that I mean that's the, this this is the first place that I ever saw those terms being translated yeah, into like right. scientific terms it's very interesting mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting thing and yeah, which makes a lot of sense. I'm saying it's just translating yes. the Kabbalistic terms into scientific terms. Mm -hmm. Any other questions?
No? For comments? I feel like it's probably better to end here even though a few minutes early than to start the next section of the mime. It's going to be a whole new idea. And I, I don't know if it's going to be like I'm so close to the end of class, we're not really going to be able to develop it properly. But I'm open to hearing what other people think um, about that. I would like to chew on this one a little more uh, before we go on to the next next one because it's like a breathing space. Yeah, I I think so. There's a whole new idea. I mean, the very beginning just compares it to Maisha, and then it goes into a whole a whole new idea, which is going to be fascinating um, about the definition of different kinds of souls. But I feel like I feel like we should maybe you know. To be, just five minutes to end of class, but um, but if, other, if people have other questions, or we can certainly. Okay. Chaya, would you mind to set, to send the, the the tape? It's like allowing these ideas to marinate helps to absorb them. We, I don't know that we can completely understand them right um, but we can we can hear them again and again and then they sort of start to seep in you know they right. really start to seep in so can you can you send it to me also it's bobby yeah yeah sure um so it's uh, it's that, sarah miller i'll take it also <laughs> <laughs> okay maybe i should does everybody want it <laughs> I think yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. Yes. <laughs> okay, so then maybe I can just do that. Okay, God willing. Thank um, okay, so, so that maybe we'll call it a day for now and wish everybody a good day. Thank Thanks. you. And a, thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank thank you. Good day. Bye. Good week. Thank, thank you so much, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.